The next person that I would like to introduce you to is a wonderful person that I've met. Um, he is also a YNI graduate of YNI High School. Um, he is from Sea Rider Productions himself, and um, he is going to show you his story about storytelling and how he has made an impact. So if we could give him a warm welcome. Good evening, everybody. <laughs> give it up for Des. Didn't she do well? Like for real. No, I gotta, I gotta follow the, the awesome presentation. Um, how's it ready back there? Good, okay. All right. So um, thank you all for coming. I really appreciate seeing all your faces and uh, not nervous at all, but now nah, let's get going. So. I want to talk to you guys today about storytelling, um, and specifically the utilization of digital media to tell your stories. So, I like quotes. You guys like quotes? After nourishment, shelter, and companionship, stories are the thing we need most in the world. That's one of my favorite authors, Philip Pullman, and I really believe that's true. Um, and not only that, but I think that stories can do those things for us as well. They nourish our minds and our hearts. They, they can shelter us from the, the horrible things that are going on around us sometimes. And when we're alone, you know, you have a good movie, you have a good book. You don't feel so alone anymore, right? So what is a story? According to the Oxford English Dictionary, a story is an account, of uh, <clears throat> excuse me, an account of imaginary or real people and events told for entertainment or an account of past events in someone's life uh, or in the evolution of something. So that's the Oxford English Dictionary definition. Now let's go through an indigenous lens. Let's talk about Native Hawaiian storytelling um, and any other indigenous cultural storytelling around the world, really, which traditionally, it's a retelling of events, um, usually for the purposes of teaching. I think, you know, you can make a case that there are a lot of stories that you'll hear, uh, uh, Hawaiian, uh, Native American, uh, you know, old uh, Sumerian, Indian, Aztec, anything you can think of that are um, stories. But you'd ask a lot of the natives, and they'll probably tell you, it's told as if it's history. Uh, it's told like, this really happened, this is important, and we need to pass this on to the future generations. And what made oral storytelling even more important is that, you know, pre-contact with Europeans, a lot of indigenous languages were not written. They were always oral. Um, I mean, we had, you know, we had um, petroglyphs here in Hawaii, but there were very few, um, very old languages that were written down. <clears throat> Stories are the intellectual and philosophical link to ancestors uh, supplying knowledge that predates colonization or any assimilation into modern culture. And uh, here's another quote. We can complain because rose bushes have thorns, or we can rejoice because thorn bushes have roses. Right? What do, we, what do you take out of that? To me, it's all about perspective. The story is the facts as we perceive them. I'd also add, we may embellish the facts sometimes. Perspective. Every storyteller has a unique perspective. It's all about where you come from, who you are, uh, the experiences that you went through as a child, um, your, your political views, your religious beliefs, all of that plays into your perspective. Some stories are designed to persuade. Others are meant to rally the people who are already believers, right? And then some are designed to misinform. So it's responsible to try to understand that the perspectives and the biases of the storytellers that are attempting to persuade and provoke us, you know, that's, that's, we need to understand where they're coming from. We need to see what's the agenda, 
What do they want me to know? What do they want me to feel? And at the same time, for the stories that we tell, I feel like this is a must. Um, we should be as true to the story as we see it, as we feel it, as we possibly can, right? The purpose of a storyteller is not to tell you how to think, but to give you questions to think upon. I think any good movie, any good book, um, you know, any good journalist, any good photograph, any good song will do that to you, right? You stay up at night thinking about it. You wake up the next day thinking about it. You talk to people about it. So why do we tell stories? To me, the purpose of telling stories, it's either to teach, inform, which is not exactly the same thing, persuade, or entertain. And I think a lot of times entertainment comes with it. If you're good at it, you should feel entertained while you're watching or listening or reading to or you know, reading anything. And down here we got that good old plot line, right? We probably learned back in English in freshman year. Starts with the exposition, which is basically the context. Something happens, that's the inciting event. Rising action is all the things that are leading up to the climax. And what happens after the climax? Whatever happens after the climax, that's the conclusion. And usually you want to, in filmmaking they taught us, you want to leave the audience with hope. So that's why we have the Hollywood ending, right? <laughs> the happy ending, right? So I want to show you something that um, I did and my colleagues did. Uh, I work for In Peace, and um, I'll get to that a little bit later. But this is a story about a program. Um, it's changed shape since I produced this, but it's one of my favorite stories. So just give you an idea of the kinds of things that I do. And it is with great belief to a Hawaiian person that the land is our older sibling. This land provides for us, and so in return we take care of the land so that the land can always provide for us. Our Kupu'ola program is looking to really bring stewards back to the land, and so how does that look for our people in today's society? Our program has started as building outdoor classrooms on the DOE campuses and in the preschool classrooms. And now we've expanded to other sites. So currently we have seven new sites here on the Waianae coast. The world is a classroom. Whether you're in a concrete jungle or in this jungle, it's all a classroom. So why, not only as an ed educator, but as a student, would you limit yourself to the four walls of a class room? There are kinesthetic learners and hands-on learners, and they learn differently. So it's vital for them to come outside and learn. If you can just take five minutes out of your day and sit outside, and listen to the birds or let the wind go through your hair. It really just calms you. And so for some students, that's what they need, that time, that space to do that so that they can get recentered and enter back into the classroom. For myself and many others, it, it, it's a, an environment that's more conducive to learning. There's obviously opportunities for science. There's obviously opportunity to get your creative juices flowing. With outdoor classrooms, we create opportunities for this to happen. I participated in Kupu'ola's Lavahi Hanai. Every month, it's on the third Saturdays of the month. It's conveniently located just two blocks up from where I live at Nanakuli Elementary. We invite community to come out, and when they come, they bring something that they are able to share with their community. Miss Claudia is an international um, <laughs> chef, Renowned and she chef. cooks all kinds of things. So how do you cook? For me, I like to remove the, the stem part, right? 
um, and just get some salt or Hawaiian salt and just lomi lomi. And we also encourage them to bring something, if anything, that they are growing at their home. It feels wonderful sharing it, of course, with our other family members or at Lawahi Hanai. And then we work together as a ohana to malama the land. Do you think that slug has a name? Do you want to give it a name? Oh, we love it. We have a three-year-old daughter, Kira, and it's a, it's a really good experience for her. It's a learning experience and we get the opportunity to, uh, I feel like a better parent bringing her here and having her help out the community, uh, meet new people play with new friends. And when that portion of the day is done, then we get together and we talk about a plant that we focus on. Every family gets a plant that they can take home. That's what I really look forward to, that part of the, the day when we leave with a plant and start our own little garden. But yeah, having what we need in our own yard is satisfying and fulfilling. That's kind of our focus every month here at Lavahi Hanai. On a clear morning sunrise between Pupukea on the north shore of Oahu, you can see as far as Mauna Kea on the Big Island. Where are you from? We're from Nana Kuli. He's like, ooh, we're from Waianae, ooh. Well, you know what? There's a little moot to that, all right? One of our projects that we're currently working on is at Nanakuli High School. Iokaha is a program for students who need to recover credits. Kind of a hands-on learning program. It's for students who are having problems in school, so they're put in this program to regain credits or help them on their everyday learning basis. They went to the fish pond to help rebuild a fish pond. Um, they had a lot of fun with that. We went hiking above the school to see the school and to look at Native Hawaiian plants. The main purpose of the hands-on program and working out in the community is to get the students reconnected with school, to get them caught up and so they can get back into their grade level and graduate with their class. I think a lot of these students get a bad reputation because they're not into traditional schooling. They tend to act out behavior-wise because they're not comfortable in class. Uh, and once we get them into this program, um, it's more of a family atmosphere and non-traditional project-based learning, and they really accelerate at it. Our dream is to have a pipeline between the elementary school and then with the intermediate, then to the high school, and then hopefully eventually to West Oahu. Well, for college, I wanted to take up Hawaiian studies to become a Hawaiian teacher too. And what I learned in Ioka really helped me to understand the Hawaiian style. Not all knowledge is measured by a standardized test. Some students work better when they're working with their hands. They connect better when they're outside working with the community. We need to reach all of our students here at Nanakuli High School. They all have strengths, and this is how they can find their strength. You know, once in my life I was that student who really didn't have that foundation. I mean, I, I knew who I was and I knew where I was going, but there was so much more to that, so much more that I wanted to learn. And so I feel like it's my kuleana now to give back to the students who are currently in our school systems. And it's not limited to agriculture, it's, it's the way you think, not what's in it for me but how can I serve my community? How can I serve the people around me? How can I serve the land, the water? If we all grab that attitude, and if we all grab that way of thinking, it'd be a lot better world. Thank you, thank you. Um, how's the audio over there? You guys can hear all right? Okay, good, very good. Um, so, stories are how we know others, and they're also how others know us, right? Everything we know about the world is a story. Just follow me here for a little bit. Parts of that story are fiction, and that has to do with perception, right? Stories are what represent you, me, whole races and nations, whole groups of people in someone's mind. 
Our brains attempt to simplify all the perceivable reality that we have around us using our eyes, our ears, all our senses, in order to help us make judgments and executive decisions. The reason there's a duck here, right, is you guys know that saying, if it walks like a duck, if it quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck, right? That's your brain. It's telling you it's a duck. Maybe it's not a duck. And this is one thing I can say for sure. Your story is out there. Somebody is telling it. That's a guarantee. All of us in here have a story about us that is out there being told. Um, and the example I give is, like Des said, right? The reputation we have on the west coast of Oahu. What do people say about us? What, what do we hear about ourselves in the news? What do we hear about ourselves in literature, if that ever happens, in movies? I know in shows, I hear people talk about, oh, don't go to Waianae, that kind of stuff, right? Be the steward of your own story. So that's what we're trying to do, right? If you tell your story, then you take ownership of it. Nobody else is gonna beat you to that. Don't let them. So this is my story. I'm sorry I didn't introduce myself at the beginning. I didn't realize I was gonna be, you know, this far into the <laughs> presentation before you actually heard my name. So my name is Nicholas Randolph Lokahi Smith. Uh, I was born on May 22nd, uh, 1986 at Kaiser in Moanalua. My parents are Randy and Deanna. My mom is here, over there. Give a round of applause for my mom, Deanna. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was raised in Makaha and Nanakuli. Um, ethnically, I am Dutch Indonesian on my dad's side, also, I think, Belgian on my dad's side. From my mom, I get Yugoslavian, which breaks down to Serbian, Bulgarian, Croatian, and Macedonian, German, French, all kinds of stuff. Some things I probably haven't even heard, right? Um, and who came to the last, speak, uh, the, the last talk with Roel and, yeah. Do you remember he broke down his name? I thought that was really cool. So I figured I'd do that for this one. So my first name comes from Old Greek, Nike and Laos. Not the country Laos, but it means victory of the people. Uh, Randolph, that's my dad's name actually. Um, and it comes from the Germanic Scandinavian, which basically means shield wolf. Lokahi is something that my grandpa gave me, I'm pretty sure. Yeah? Yes. And I think it was because I was a very calm child. And Smith literally means to strike. And it was also a, a signifier for somebody who worked with metal. So, what does that say about me? Who knows? <laughs> uh, I went to Komaili Elementary. I went to Waianae Intermediate School. Um, at Waianae Intermediate, I met uh, Linda Ginoza. Um, that's the beginning of my storytelling journey, I would say. I would say. <clears throat> uh, mass media, I joined in eighth grade. We did uh, this little news program during homeroom called Waianae 5-4, and it was so cool. And uh, when I went to high school, um, there, you know, there's a bunch of teachers and people that really had a a big impact on me. Um, the late Asa Yamashita, she was um, my class advisor, my freshman English teacher. Steve Schick was my junior English teacher. Uh, Sparky Rodriguez in Kovika Naho'opi'i from Olelo Community Television. I remember going down and back on the Waianae Coast and Uncle Sparky asking me the whole time, what is the story that you want to tell? And I'm like a freshman, right? I have no idea what I'm doing, what I'm trying to think. And he's just asking me, what's the story? What do you see? What do you feel, right? I think he really got me thinking in that direction. Um, Janice Oimori, uh, through student union, I went to a leadership camp uh, before my junior year. And it just, I don't know, it just made me feel really good. And when I came back my junior year, I had the best school year I ever had. I think I had like a 3.8 that year. It was amazing. Um, and Elisa, uh, she was another English teacher of mine, but also a Leo Club advisor. And um, my track coach, Derek Higa. Uh, th those are the people that really 
you know, had a big impact on me. And of course, at Sea Rider Productions, Lorraine Gershon, Candy Suiso, John Allen, um, that's where I learned to be a cameraman. It's where I learned to speak in front of a camera and, and I got better speaking in front of audiences. And uh, you know, there's some, some former SP alums as well in here, right? Um, I, I, I like when I see them because I know that we're all doing pretty well. Um, after that, I went to college at the Art Institute of California, Los Angeles. I got my Bachelor of Science in Digital Filmmaking and Video Production. Um, let me take a second to say, if you're thinking about going to a for-profit school, don't. <laughs> Just don't, right? This is kind of like um, University of Phoenix. It's kind of like Argosy. Like Argosy is like the sister school. And I'm not trying to bash the school itself. And if you're already there, I'm sorry. It's just about it's the, it's the financial aspect of it. I was lazy when I was that age. I didn't read all the fine print. And so I was walking out of school with a lot of debt. Like more than, like I would tell people how much and they'd be like, what did you do, buy a house? Like seriously, right? So that's my two cents on that. Um, my hobbies, I love to catch waves, I like taking pictures, and I play some video games every now and then. Uh, I'm a, free, a freelance photography, or a photographer and videographer. Um, I've shot with models, I shoot weddings, I've done events. Um, I also get in the water from time to time. Um, this is a cool one because it started out as a hobby. And then now there's people asking me if they can buy prints of some of my wave shots and stuff like that. So, you know, I like that. Like that one, actually, that's going to go to a friend of mine. Um, and I'll be psyched when it's hanging on her wall. Uh, I worked at Macaw Studios after college from 2008 to 2012. I was the creative director. Um, had some amazing times there. Got to travel about 18 different states, uh, at least three, four, five times a year I was off the island uh, meeting all kinds of amazing people. And I, I feel like that really shaped me into what I am today. Um, and now I work at InPeace and I'm a digital storyteller. Um, so you got to see a little bit of what I do in that last video, right? You guys resonate with that video at all? Anybody, uh, is anybody taking part in um, any of our programs? Any, raise hands, who has taken part in In Peace program? Okay, we got a couple, <laughs> right? But you know what that tells me? That tells me that I need to do a better job of storytelling because people don't know <laughs> what we have out there and everything we have is free. Everything that we have is at no cost to, um, you know, to, to the person that we service. So this is my charge. I tell stories using modern media, gathering and sharing technology. So that's my camera, my laptop, my phone, and social media. Uh, digital storytellers, we produce, there's three of us. We produce uh, uh, videos and still pictures that document in pieces efforts in Hawaii. Um, and we tell the stories of the people in our community. Uh, we also manage In Peace's social media um, presence. So if you don't mind, give us a follow, please. So this is one more video that I'm going to share. Um, we actually have somebody who's being featured in the video in the back, Claudia Quintanilla. <laughs> Claudia works for a program called PAT where um, they go into your home and they visit you uh, between, what, six months and three years now? Gotcha. And they help you, um, they, they, they teach you anything that you want to know about being a new parent, an existing, you know, you already had kids. Um, it's a great program, so let's give it a look. Lights, please. I do what I do because I have a love for children. My son has guided me 
in my career. You know, he has been that motivation to make sure that I pursue what is important in the community. I've seen the impact that early childhood education programs can make on families, and I don't want anybody else to miss out on that. So every child has a greatness. It's up to the parent to see that greatness in their child. I want them to see that greatness in their child. That's why I do what I do. Okay. So this one here is reflecting on parenting support. Koala means to awaken. So, we have two components. We have the community recruiters as well as the parents as teachers, parent educators. We have four community recruiters that go door to door in the community to recruit children into early childhood education programs along the entire coast. So we knock door to door and find families who have children under the age of five and talk story with them to see what their needs are as far as um, early childhood education programs and help them through the whole process from getting information to filling out the applications to making sure they do all the enrollment documents until they actually get into a program. No, just going to school right now. Okay. So I actually just met with Kathy from In Peace who actually talked to me about getting my son into an early education program. Yes. <laughs> so it's going to be two, yeah? yeah? Since the beginning, the community recruiters um, have knocked on nearly 8,000 doors Aloha, from Kahe to Kaena Point. They have nearly enrolled over 190 children in the early childhood education programs along our coast. That doesn't only impact the development of the child, but it also impacts the entire family. Yes. Parents as Teachers is a home visiting program. We service prenatal to three years old. Our program is geared to uh, empower our families or our parents to become their child's first teacher. So families come in at prenatal stages. Mommies are prenatal and we work with the moms during their prenatal stages to make sure that they get the proper prenatal care, that they're interacting with their baby even though their baby is unborn. The second component is the child developmental piece, which um, as we continue to have these ongoing home visits, um, when the child is born, we begin assessments and we determine whether or not there's delays or where the strengths are of the child and kind of follow their development to make sure that they're meeting their milestones. I basically visit families in their homes. I educate them about their child's uh, age and stage of development and um, I bring age-appropriate activities to them. I bring handouts that explains about their child's development. It's just been a fun time, you know, just learning and just growing, you know, just to have that, that extra, um, you know, hand just helping me and just showing us how to actually be there in good ways, you know, for our children. Kahea has been such a, um, a blessing from the get-go, strong woman. She you know, young mom, had two children, trying to make things work for her own family. And that's what it's all about, supporting the whole family. That's good to know, you know, that even though the, um, that this Parent as Teachers program, it will come to an end, just knowing that, you know, that she's not just up and leaving, you know, that she's still nurturing us in which, in a way that can still help us. Knowing that Chloe is going to be exiting the program, she's already preparing what she wants to do. So she's on her way to, you know, being um, an asset to this community. She can relate to plenty of individuals and families that's here on the Leeward Coast, you know. It's not where I, she's from somewhere else coming in, you know. She's here, she knows it, you know, she, she can relate. Oh, oh, yeah, we used to go to church with them. Oh, the fact that yeah. all four community recruiters do live in the community and are you know, we're raising our families here in the community. A lot of times we're a familiar face. So a lot of times people are like, hey, I kind of know you, you look familiar. And so more times than not, we kind of get a connection with them that way. So that's very helpful in getting them to at least listen to us. There's a preschool in there. We've had the opportunity to help a lot of families in the year and a half that we've been knocking on doors. There's several families that we've met either in late 2011 or early 2012, who now this year in 2013, we've been able to get them enrolled. And it's rewarding because we don't, ever give up on the family. We're not out there to judge. We're out there to meet our families exactly where they're at. If it means that they have to sit down with a family and do an application 
to help help them through the process, they'll do it. If it takes four home visits, they'll do it. They'll do whatever it takes to help the families in our community get their children enrolled into early childhood programs as well as accessing resources. Thank you, thank you. Shameless plug here, right? Like I said, it's free. If anybody in here has a, a young, you know, very young child, um, anybody you know has a keiki that, that, that is that age, um, please come to me. I'll hook you up with the right people. Uh, you know, if you want to learn how to become the best parent that you can be, or you want to just learn a little bit more about your baby's brain development, motor skills, that kind of, all that kind of stuff, we got it covered, okay? All right. So for the sake of, you know, my title, digital storytelling, right? We're going to talk about how this applies in today's age, right? Everybody has phones. Everybody has probably a Facebook, maybe a Twitter, probably an Instagram too. And what that means is you have access at your fingertips to about a sixth of the world's population. No kidding. Right? Facebook has about a billion users. Instagram's about a 200 million, I think. Twitter's about 600 million. That means you can be part of immense conversations. So here are the tools that you can use to start telling your own story and to tell the stories of the people that are you know, important to you. What I like about, this fo uh, about photographs is that they capture a moment that's gone forever, impossible to reproduce. That's so true, right? They told us in the industry, if you didn't shoot it, it never happened. And that, that really, really applies. This is one of my favorite photos, and this is before social media, but this went viral. Like, as viral as it could go back in the day, it did. It's called Afghan Girl. The one on the left, um, Steve McCurry, 1984. So this is right in the middle of, um, I believe, Russia and Afghanistan are going at it. Um, all kinds of complex politics there. But what the photo says to me is that for us so far away, right, this appeared in National Geographic. Look at the innocence that is being put in jeopardy by these bullets, by these bombs, right? And the cool thing is McCurry went back 20 years later and found the same girl. And it was a, it was a journey. And they actually did a retinal scan to verify that it was her. And, and you know, as you can see, she's, she's weathered, she's aged, um, but the same person, right? Now, all images don't have to be pictures like that you take with a camera, right? And when we were talking earlier about owning your story, this is exactly what I mean, okay? On the left, you have the Mercator projection map, and that's a map that's been in every classroom that I can think of for decades, right? Does anything look weird about that map? Right, well, so the first thing is America's right in the middle, and what they call that is a a Western-centric, that's basically the idea. It's that Europe and America are the most important thing on the planet. That's the subtext. That's what people will pick up without even being told, right? The second thing is, if you look at Africa and North America, they look about the same size, right? So just in terms of visual cues, you think, America's pretty important. When in reality, this is how big Africa is. America fits in that space right at the, at the top. And Africa, Africa's immense. And what I'm getting at is that we're being taught very subversely as kids that, you know, one is more important than the other. Or at least of equal importance, and one is lesser, right? So this is an example of a way that 
Um, like this, this one on the right, this, this was circling, uh, circulating around about a year ago. It's an example of people trying to set the record straight, trying to own the story, saying, no, look at how big this place is. Look at how important and wealthy it should be. And yet it's one of the most war-torn places on earth. Right? And here's another image that just, it screams, right? Tiananmen Square. Imagine facing down a tank, an actual tank. And for those of you who know what happened after this shot was taken, you understand the gravity of the, of the situation, right? This is a college student who was peacefully occupying this place and the new regime was moving in to try and capture Tiananmen Square. So another tool is words. <clears throat> and this is one of my um, favorite songs by Del Beasley. Every day I look around me, nothing looks the same. Another golf course, another high rise, ain't it insane? Another Hawaiian bites the dust, another family must move. Well, I'm feeling so helpless, I just keep singing the brown man blues. That was 20 years ago. Don't we still have the same problems today? Homelessness, people moving away because they can't afford to live here. All this development, right? Now, we'll get a little bit light here. Uh, it doesn't have to be a lot of words. That's one line, feel the burn, right? And that's, uh, for those of you who don't know, Bernie Sanders, um, the unofficial campaign slogan that the internet just kind of threw upon him. And, and one of his main criticisms coming into this, this uh, election cycle was that he's just not very exciting. You know, the guy's been around for years. He's fought every battle there is to fight. He's been on the right side of every vote. But nobody really cares because he's not Donald Trump. He's not angering people, he's not exciting, right? So the internet is trying to jazz up his image because <laughs> the internet loves him. And something local, right? Very simple, Kapu Aloha. As simple as you can possibly get. And it has so much meaning, right? It's basically love thy enemy, love, love uh, without restraint. Um, don't hurt anybody. No matter how much they hurt you, don't. But you can still stand up. Right? You don't have to let them beat you down. And of course, the last piece of this, you know, this toolkit is your community. It's everybody here and all your friends and all your family at home. A dream you dream alone is only a dream. A dream you dream together is a reality. Now, I want to talk a little bit about going viral. So, for those of you who may not understand the term, right, uh, when we talk about viral on the internet, it means when an image, a video, a piece of information is circulated rapidly and widely from one internet user to another, right? So, maybe it starts with me, and the right person sees it and they share it. And then tomorrow, there's 20,000 people that have seen it. That's viral. Right, so there's some examples of what this has done in the world recently. In Egypt in 2011, um, their dictator was he's kind of not a nice guy. And one of the things he did that was like really the last straw before the revolution was he shut off the internet. So nobody could use their, their, all their land, you know, land lines, right? But they couldn't shut down Twitter. So what did people do? They went to Twitter, they started tweeting, and it went all over the world, right? I'm an, e uh, I'm an Egyptian who lives in NYC. Please spread far and wide. Egypt is on an info lockdown. Mubarak regime has shut down the internet. And look what happened. The entire country rose up. This is weeks, a month later and you got millions of people in the streets fighting for what they believe in, when before, maybe they were scared. They were afraid to be that first person to, uh, you know, to stand up and, and to, to occupy their ground and not give it up. And it's a different place now. 
It's a complicated situation, but it's different for sure. And then this is something, of course, that happened, and I'm sure everybody was witness to this, um, the We Are Mauna Kea movement. I know I saw a shirt over there somewhere, somebody wearing the shirt. But, uh, you know, this happened in the same kind of way. Uh, for years now, there's a group that's been fighting the building of the telescope and lots of other things. And recently, it got a little bit of steam moving online. Then Jason Momoa posted, we are Mauna Kea on his chest. And then Nicole Scherzinger jumped in. And before you knew it, there were celebrities, there were uh, people all over the world sending in pictures, tweeting, writing to, you know, uh, donating, buying t-shirts, buying hats. Um, and, and we had tens of thousands of shares and likes and views Lots of people making videos, lots of people taking pictures. And look what happened. They actually were able to stop the, the telescope from being built, at least temporarily. And that's a multi-billion dollar operation. I, I, I would be lying if I said I thought they would be successful. Like, <laughs> this is 11 different countries or something like that. About two or three billion dollars. There's no way you can stop that, but they did. Amazing. Now, what can we accomplish, right? We can tell our stories. What are the issues that are important to us as a community? Important to you as individuals, important to your families? I can think of a few. Homelessness, the cost of living and housing, the environment, traffic, right? Who drives in that traffic every single day? Unwanted development, like all kinds of things happening, right? They just want to come and build all willy-nilly. Food and water, education, so many more things. And all you need to do to start telling those stories is to have a phone, because pretty much everybody's phone, I'm sure, has a camera on it. You can record video and take pictures. Have an inter internet connection. So if you don't have internet at home, go to Starbucks, go to you know, McDonald's. Um, your passion, your time, and then your network of people. If you really want to make something happen, coordinate. Say, I want to tweet this, right? Okay, then get 30 people to do it all at the same time. Then maybe somebody who's watching will say, oh wow, there's a lot of people talking about this, right? It's a little bit important, so maybe I'll look further into this. Then before you know it, you have 1,000. Then maybe you have 10,000, right? That's how it works. I could not stop talking because now I had started my story. It wanted to be finished. We cannot choose where to start and stop. Our stories are the tellers of us. And the last thought I'll leave you with kind of goes with this is, even if you don't do all of that stuff, all the fancy stuff, maybe you think, oh, that's a little bit too, you know, I don't know if I can do that. Your life is your story. What you do, your actions, your words, that's a story. And that's what people will gather when they meet you. That's what people will have in their minds when, when they walk away from your conversation. They'll remember something. And that's the story that they'll make up in, in their heads, right? So be the steward of that story. Live the best life you can live at, on your own terms, and you're doing it. You know, you're beating that Waianae stereotype, that, that Hawaii stereotype, all of those things. So, mahalo for your time. <laughs>